This is the section on linear momentum. Momentum, given by a letter P, is the object's mass multiplied by an object's velocity. You might wonder why is this the letter P, why isn't it the letter M? The reason why we use P for momentum is because M was already taken by mass, and also because if you go back to the original Latin word for momentum, it starts with a P, so that's why they settled on that. So when you just mathematically speaking, the equation for momentum is just simply P, momentum, equals mass times velocity. Another way to think about momentum is it is an object's inertia in motion. It's mass in motion. It's just a property of any object that has mass and is moving. Now, for momentum, direction is very, very important. So these have two objects. Uh, the momentum are the same size because this one is 3 kilograms and 2 meters per second, so that is a momentum of 6 kilogram meters per second. And this one is 2 kilograms times 3 meters per second, which again is 6 kilogram meters per second. But this one is to the right, so we would say it's positive, and this one is to the left, so we would say it is negative. So uh, the, mo the direction of the momentum is very important. You need to make sure that you know if it's positive or negative before you start any problem. So what's the point? Why do we care about momentum? Well, this is the part of physics that deals with impacts and where things are going to collide with each other. So if you want to do a football problem where someone's going to get tackled, momentum is a big deal. It's a type of collision. Car accidents are another example of this. And obviously, just a fun picture, any kind of kung fu fighting. So if you are ever going to have any objects touch each other, momentum is an important part of physics to learn. So what's the point? Why do we care? about um, momentum and how does it affect collisions? Well, it's because of something called conservation of momentum, which says when any two objects bump into each other, the momentum is going to be conserved. So the momentum of object one plus the momentum of object two equals the momentum of object one and two after the collision. That's what these little apostrophes mean. It's, uh, this equation is read P1 plus P2 equals P1 prime plus P2 prime. That just means after the collision. So in this particular problem, you have uh, two gentlemen, one on the right a little bit larger, and he pushes himself into the guy with no shirt on. And because he's got so much momentum, because he's quite a bit larger even than this guy, he imparts that momentum over to him. So you'll notice that the guy in the white shirt is moving to our left and pushes to the left right there at the time of the collision. And the guy on the left, all the momentum was transferred to him, and he got off balance and fell into that group over there. So this is a situation where momentum is conserved. So if you want to run into somebody who's quite a bit bigger than you, as this guy is, you want to make sure that you're moving a little bit faster. Otherwise, you're going to shoot back like this poor guy did. All right, now there are different types of collisions. We can break them down into two types. One is elastic collision, and the other is an inelastic collision. In an elastic collision, that's where we're talking about things that bounce off of each other. Now, perfectly elastic collision we'll get to in a second, but we usually describe situations where the objects hit and bounce off of each other, like in bowling or in pool or um, in things of that nature. We describe that as an elastic collision. Then you have inelastic collision, which is really anything that's not a perfectly elastic collision, but is mainly in physics used to describe collisions where the two objects stick together. So this particular football player looks like he is about to crush this one, uh, but notice that they were separate before they hit each other, and now they're going to both go to the ground as like one large object that are put together. So we're going to start off with elastic collisions. A perfectly elastic collision is one where all the kinetic energy is conserved. So all the kinetic energy before equals all the kinetic energy after. An example of this would be if you were to drop a rubber ball onto the floor and it would bounce right back up to the same height that your hand is at when you dropped it. And that typically does not happen. You get pretty close in some, certain situations. And we can describe certain things. We can approximate them as such, like in pool and things, and we'll assume that there's very little energy lost. But... Um, for the most part, those don't happen in real life. But we still call basically any, any situation that's kind of close, where things bounce off of each other, to be an elastic collision. Now, why is it that we don't get elastic collisions happening regularly? And that's because the energy gets lost. So if this, this block of jello falls here, hits the ground, and you can see that it's deforming. And as a result, all that energy stops being kinetic energy and turns into internal energy of the structure vibrating or shaking or just deforming and reforming. But that's okay because we can still use conservation of momentum, which is why we don't use conservation of energy typically in impact problems because energy is not conserved because of things like the object just moving about. 
So in an elastic collision, how do we do this? We still use conservation of momentum, and we still have our equation P1 plus P2 equals P1 prime plus P2 prime. And that's going to become, because remember, momentum is mv, the mass of the first object multiplied by its velocity plus the mass of the second object times its velocity equals the mass of the first object times velocity after the collision plus mass of the second object times velocity after the collision. So you basically just need to know the masses of the object and how fast they're going either before or after and you can figure out what's going to happen either before they collided or after they collide. And then we have inelastic collision. These are the types of collisions where the things stick together after they hit. So car crashes where they run into each other and you might think that oh wait this wouldn't be well, kind of a cool image, that wouldn't be an inelastic collision because his hand's not going to stick to the other boxer. But they hit and they move together for a bit after the collision. Eventually he'll pull his hand away, but this guy's face and this guy's hand are going to sort of stick together for a little bit after. They're not going to bounce off of each other. So that's a type of inelastic collision. So in an inelastic collision, we still use conservation of momentum, and that equation is going to, you know, here's the same one that we had for elastic. But what's going to end up happening is these velocities after the fact are going to be the same because they stuck together. So we don't have two different velocities on the right side, we just have one. And we factor that out, which we can do, and sometimes mathematically it's helpful if we're trying to find this V prime. If we factor this because we're looking for it, our equation turns into something like this. And then we can solve for V prime if that's what we're looking for just by dividing the two masses over. So it's a very common thing that happens in inelastic collisions. Finally, we get separation problems, where two objects are together, and then they're going to separate and push off of each other. That looked like it hurt. So an example of this is a bullet inside of a gun. Right now, the bullet and the gun are not moving once he's holding it still, so they have zero momentum to start, and he pulls the trigger, and they're going to have momentum. So why is it that we get kickback on a gun? Because the bullet here shoots off to the right with a lot of momentum. Well, momentum is conserved, so if the bullet gains a lot of momentum to the right, the gun has to gain the exact same momentum back to the left. And unfortunately, that back to the left is back into this guy's face. But that is a separation problem, where two objects are moving together, or not moving at all, and then push off of each other. In a separation problem, we still have the exact same equation. It's still mv, m1v plus m2v equals m1v prime plus m2v prime, but... Uh, what often will happen is the v's over here can very are very regularly be zero. So if that happens, this whole side becomes zero, and we just know that the momentums after the fact have to be equal to each other. So it's a pretty much easier problem to do. Here we're going to finish up with impulse. Impulse uh, given by the letter J is a change in momentum. And how do you change an object's momentum? You have to exert a force on it, and you have to exert a force over a particular amount of time. Impulse has a direction. It's either positive or it's negative. It depends on the direction of the problem. Now, why do we care about impulse? We care about impulse because of something called the impulse momentum theorem, which is actually a very, very handy theorem in solving problems, but also in engineering and in just your everyday life. So the force multiplied by the time, the total force acting on an object, multiplied by the time during which that force acts is equal to the change in momentum. Often in these problems, the momentum after the fact is going to go to zero, because we're talking about collisions where something's going to hit and stop. So why do we care about the impulse momentum theorem? Remember this delta, this little triangle just means change in momentum, writing that for the sake of ease. Well, that's equal to force multiplied by time. If in a collision, the time it takes for the two objects to be in contact, or for, let's say, a car accident for the object to stop, if the time is small, the force acting on you has to be really, really big. But if we extend that time by using things like airbags and make the time larger, then the force acting on you is smaller. So if you have a little itty bitty time, you're going to have to have a lot of force. If you have a really big time, then you don't need as much force in order to do the same job. I'll give you some examples of that. So here's an example of a big force and a little time. So the kid's moving, 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 and that probably did not feel good. So this kid's momentum is changing because he's got momentum because he's moving and he stops. Well, because he hit a pole, he stopped very, very, very quickly. So his time to stop was very, very small, which means the force acting on him to make him stop had to be very, very big. And that tends to make for not a particularly good day. And the converse of that is when you have a little force because your time is larger. So here's actually... Uh, an example of one where the time is going to be a little bit larger and one where the time is not. 
This particular guy jumps onto a bed and seems like he's probably ready to go to sleep. It's, you know, quite comfy. This guy's doing pretty much the same thing, but his friend isn't very nice and pushes the mattress away from him. So in both situations, a person is jumping and just going to land, and they're going to come to a stop. But up here on the top left, this particular guy lands on the mattress, so he's cushioned. His stop takes quite a bit more time. You can actually see him bounce up and down and up and down a little bit as he's coming to rest, as he's coming to a stop. This gentleman, on the other hand, hits and just stops very, very quickly. So when the time for him to come to a stop or his momentum to change is small, then the force has to be quite large. And that is why the impulse momentum theorem is important. Now, when do we use this? We use this in things like car safety features, in pads for um, athletics, and pretty much any time that you want to minimize a force, running shoes, things of that nature. So you're going to find that in sports everywhere, uh, as well as other places if you start looking around in your daily life.